Live, VMworld 2012. I'm John Furrier, just talking about the CEO roundtable we're watching right now with uh, Pat Gelsinger holding court because of his excellent cube experience. <laughs> so uh, we're going to get that out on the record that uh, he looks polished, smooth, right on messaging, cloud mobile and social. Um, we heard Shadow IT, Dave. Uh, great, uh, great, great job by Pat Gelsinger. This is VMworld 2012, this is John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Uh, we are here live. Dave, final segment of the day, how do you feel? Oh, it's great, We're, uh, we got a, a repeat guest, BJ Jenkins, president of EMC's BRS division, uh, a suffering Red Sox fan with me, <laughs> but, uh, you know, West Coast now, I guess that, that helps. Been getting worse pain, and right? worse, no, it never, <laughs> never goes away, never goes Football away. Football season's coming. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so welcome back to theCUBE, it's Thanks. great to see you Thanks guys. for having awesome. me guys, yeah. great Thanks, to see great you. Thanks, great to see you. Yeah. So uh, the question is, um, obviously VMworld, what are you seeing out there? Obviously you got a lot going on. We're hearing backup and recovery, we had MLB on earlier, um, Major League Baseball, yeah. speaking of baseball, um, <laughs> TV operation, and they're, you know, uh, backup and recovery is part of their big part of their operations now. They're trying to figure it out in a, in a new way, right? So we've been talking about this modern era of, of uh, computing with data infrastructure being kind of the new theme that's changed converged infrastructure, building on the shoulders of converged infrastructure. One of those areas is backup and recovery, um, and it's not going away, it's never going away. It's one of those areas that just doesn't go away. Yeah. In fact, it's more important when you think about the new virtualization and new cloud. So what is your lens show you on this show? Well, I, you know, I think it's something, it's a continuation of what we've always, you know, talked about is most uh, data protection infrastructures were set up, you know, for tape and for a legacy type of environment. And, you know, you see this in, at VMworld every time we come, the world's completely moved away from that. And whether it's, uh, you know, mobile and social, like we were just talking about, everything's on, everything, you need access and availability always, and that's a big driver for data protection. If you have an issue, no matter what it's at, whether you know it's an application or data on a personal device, that user now expects instant recovery, and you can't do that with legacy infrastructure. You can't do it with tape. Uh, you have to do it disk-based, and you've got to find a way to you know, capacity optimize, which is where deduplications had a big play in this environment, but be able to put it on disk and get it back very quickly. So give us a quick you. update since VMworld, what's happened uh, with you guys. EMC and World. I mean EMC <laughs> World, what <laughs> end of the day. <laughs> since EMC yeah. World, give us the update. we're talking real time. Yes, yeah. it <laughs> is. What's the update since this morning when yes, you got up? Exactly. Uh, since EMC World when you were on, what, any, any new updates? to share? Uh, we've had a tremendous amount of product launches since EMC World. At EMC World, we had refreshed the high-end data domain in Avamar, and uh, in July, uh, Networker 8.0 came out. It was the uh, 22nd anniversary of Networker, and uh, that, was a, that was a big announcement for us, but I think you know the thing that we're really excited about here is uh, VMware selected and worked with BDP. EMC yeah. to uh, you know, build VDP into vSphere. Huge and uh, that, that's a, a real big announcement for us. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, VDR was VMware's, uh, basically a backup appliance, a free Correct. backup appliance with vSphere 5, now Correct. with vSphere 5.1. VDP is replacing right. uh, the previous product. It's a, a free offering yep. for the customers. It's based on Avamar technology. That's correct. Which has always had a very strong Presence in, in the VMware, VMware world, yeah. In any virtualized environment, yeah. You know, for the very nature of its technology, yeah. dealing with uh, you know reducing I/O traffic, right, yep. at the source. So, that's right. congratulations on that deal. That's a big um, announcement for us. Th 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 I, I read Chad's blog this morning. <laughs> it looks like it was a pretty significant uh, undertaking to to actually do that integration. Yeah, it was. I have to say this. I have to go off topic, and it's probably not good for this audience. But no, I just went to the bathroom, and you know how they have. The small stalls and the big stalls. The small stall has a sign that says "Reserved for Chad Sackick," which <laughs> I just thought was hilarious. He'll, He'll be on the cube tomorrow. Yeah, we'll so you let can him let him know. know his, his <laughs> bath. But um, this has been a two-year effort for us. Um, you know, we put uh, besides our Avamar engineering team, which is over, you know, 400 engineers. We actually put 60 dedicated engineers to this to 
uh, build on top of the Flex uh, framework that VMware has, and it looks, it is a VMware product. This is offered through vSphere, and you can use it within that framework, which I think is powerful. You get all the power of Avamar, you know, in, in the VMware uh, framework, which is great for so, us. So I don't know if you had a chance to read Chad's blog. He basically said, you know, there were two analyst you know, news reactions, yeah. right? One was, this is, you know, tremendous uh, confirmation of Avamar technology, to which he totally agreed, and the other one was, this marks a change in the whole, yeah. you know, VMware relationship, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's saying it's an inside deal, but, uh, but tell us sort of, I mean, uh, VMware's not just going to, you know, yeah. <laughs> throw its, you know, a uh, uh, future way just because it's a sister company. So how did you actually win that deal? It, it, and, and take us through kind of you know, well, how that I, happened. Yeah, why, I, why, why Avamar at the back end? Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, first of all, Avamar, we believe, is the leading technology for virtual environments in the enterprise and mid-market. And really this is, an, I think VMware saw that, the capabilities that Avamar brings uh, to that customer base that they serve, and you know they looked across the market and and wanted to partner with the leading provider. I I, I think you know that's why we got chosen. Within that framework, though, of what they offer, it, it doesn't change their platform approach, and certainly they have their APIs, and the other third-party vendors are still going to continue to optimize for VMware and try and uh, you know provide to that environment. So I, I you know. I, I think people are looking at, did EMC jam this down? It VMware's was just an inside road. Yeah, it, it was, uh, evaluate the technology landscape. Um, they have a, you know, they're trying to make their platform per pervasive and partner with, with a group that uh, has the resources and the commitment in that market. And you know, today we have, in our division, over 4,000 people focused on backup every day. We, you know, uh, from a patent approach and what Avamar can do from a technology standpoint for the customers, I, I think they looked at it and said, this is, this is what we want VMware to do in the backup space. Yeah, I've always been a big fan of Avamar, and especially in virtualized environments, and I've always encouraged customers to sort of, you know, if you're going to virtualize, you better rethink your backup. You right. know, make sure that, you know, you plan that out, and, and the, the Avamar customers that we've you know, helped through that transition, have always been very, very pleased with it. It, it was a rip and replace in a lot of examples, which slowed the market down for a yeah. while, which is, uh, we all know the story of data domain, it was not a rip and replace. That's right. and, you know, they got 2.5 billion <laughs> confirmation <laughs> reasons. That's and, right. Uh, good for them, yeah. it's, uh, it was fantastic uh, to watch that whole dynamic. But, uh, but this is, we always sort of knew that the adoption of that type of technology was going to take longer, so this is a big win for Avamar, and yeah. one that's going to, I think have a lot of legs in the marketplace, especially because this is kind of the, you know, second or third rev of VMware's backup strategy. Yeah. You know, they've struggled with backup. Yep. You know, it's like Microsoft first rev, well, not so good, and then right. they get it right eventually. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and I and I think, you know, VMware probably looked at that effort to get it right, and looked at some of the other challenges on their plate and the, uh, you know, the. Uh, you know, time to market and mm -hmm. doing that. And again, I think that's why Avamar was validated based on what, what it was doing for customers. And, you know, we were talking earlier about converged infrastructure and, you know, along with VMware, how that's changing customers' IT infrastructures. One of the things that breaks right away when you start putting in converged infrastructure is that whole protection you know, backup process layer, and this is where something like Avamar comes in and reduces resource contention, improves uh, you know capacity optimization, yeah. redu you know reduces the amount of storage space you need for backups, and then I think most importantly, and the thing we talk a lot about with this announcement is, you know, the ability to you know file level restore, use the APIs for change block tracking, and you know be very very efficient mm -hmm. in how you're protecting that data is something you need in a uh, virtualized and a converged infrastructure environment. EJ, Dave and I sat down on, in January um, in, in the Wikibon offices in Marlboro, and we were looking at over the year, and, and you know, at the end of last year, we obviously went through all the different CUBE events and you know, through the market, converged infrastructure, we were totally convinced. David Floyd was doing some cutting words around IO-centric infrastructure. <laughs> the flash thing was hitting the street pretty hard. Right, right. We all knew it was happening. You guys announced Project Lightning. But one of the things that Dave and I looked at was, Converged infrastructure is an old definition, right? In other words, it's kind of like it was defined when people saw the vision and it kind of played out, but one thing that really took a shape that no one kind of saw coming in that equation was, was flash yeah. and solid state. So um, having a data-centric infrastructure, okay, and obviously when you talk about recovery, I totally see that, 
what we're trying to explore out, we've, we've decided that we're now going to kick off this new agenda called data infrastructure, where everyone we talk to, it's a different modern era of a, of a concept. And it's pretty simple, it's the data. Yeah. And you see Amazon with Glacier, it's like you know, we're going to put it in, in ice and then get five days to get your <laughs> data back. Uh, that's one concept. Yep. The other one's the normal tape. But really now the data centers are being re-architected with new, new kinds of flash, whether it's sitting in front of SANS and doing all kinds of new stuff. One, do you agree that this data infrastructure is a little bit different than conversion and the fact that it needs to be more revo uh, revolutionary versus evolutionary? And two, what is a modern era data infrastructure relative to really important stuff like backup and recovery and yeah. disaster recovery. Yeah, I, I actually think on the first one, this I, idea of data centricity or data centric approach is happening. And, you know, Glacier is one manifestation of that, which is there is a set of data, you know, archives a big space for us where we're growing into it, but their, you know, their idea is there's a set of that data that very rarely gets accessed. And if a customer could understand in their archive pools what that what subset of data that was, here's a good place to go go put it. Yeah. So um, that idea of understanding uh, the value of that information and assigning a, uh, policy. a, a policy around it is um, been around for a while, but I think this idea of applying all layers of the stack and yeah. understanding how to treat it is one that's gaining a lot of momentum. And, and certainly the things you know, we, we are trying to build for that marketplace is how do you understand that data better? We have a lot of tools at EMC that we look at and say, it understands the data. You know, Greenplum, NetWitness, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, some of ProSphere. So analytics. Under, analytics understands that data, and if you do that, you can apply policies to So you're it. saying, so let me just like catch what you're saying, because yeah. in the modern era, as we, that's our word, because we just had, baseball guys on, we talk about the modern era of, of, <laughs> of backup <laughs> here. Uh, no doping, no steroids, yeah. <laughs> got glacier, you can freeze them out. Yeah. Uh, no, but in the modern era, you're saying you got to have the ability to essentially dynamically put policy on data, which requires some big data. You, yeah. A anything else you see in this modern era, uh, infrastructure requirements? The table stakes, like we got to nail this now, the industry's moving clearly in this direction. Can you name any other? Well, I, you know, I. I I think it's easy to st say to do that. The, it's a really hard thing to do that. And then, you know, I think the big f part for us from data protection is how do you automate some of that and 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 take you know the user variability out of it. And uh, we talked, I think, at EMC World a little bit about some of the projects in this area. You know, we're looking at how you directly connect into primary storage and use tools like Fast. You know, FAST will understand access patterns on it and place it on a tier like Data Domain or, you know, like Avamar when it's the right time to be there. So automating, understanding the information first, automating a lot of those policies on it so it just happens for the user is, you know, an area I think we're, we're we, we're, we're investing a lot to make that happen. And I think you know one of the premises uh, that when John's talking about data infrastructure, we talked a lot about flash and m metadata right. control at the server level. Yeah. And I actually think you know you talk about fast, that whole archiving, you know, the fast yeah. seems to me to be really well suited for that, the whole spinning disk and down. Yeah. Uh, and you guys have, have you mentioned Glacier before. You've you guys do decent tape integration. Right. Actually, tape is not dead, despite your attempts to kill it over the years. I'll keep trying, <laughs> yeah, I'll right. keep trying, but it's but, going to uh, be there for a while. When you look at Glacier, you say, I'm, if I'm a CIO, I'm not so sure I'm going to put my data in Glacier. Right. I'd rather have right. it on, on tape personally, well, but. Uh, there, there's the, you know, the other trend that I think fits in here that we see, and it really is very applicable to the types of things VMware is saying, is this idea of user control, you know, or user tools. Uh, but still have some IT management and control over that. So when we think about data protection, we would love it. The world we see is a database administrator can use the tools they're used to, uh, Oracle RMN or Microsoft right. tools, and s have self-protection work in that world. Uh, a VMware administrator with VDP or you know the follow-ons that we do with that can self-protect and use the tools they're used to. A storage administrator can snap and replicate uh, and use those tools. But behind that, give IT the ability to manage it, report out, 
let the legal, you know, general counsel, let the, the CEO know that you are protected, you can recover, while these users use their own tools. And, uh, you know, for us, um, you know, very similar to what VMware is doing with Project Horizon, right? Give the users the ability to use their own device, but give IT some some ability to manage and, and control that. We think that's where the future is. And and if you think about data centricity, that, that you know, you, you need to do that. You need to give users the ability to manage and control some things, but still have that central, you know, IT capability to, 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 to know that it's secure and you know you're doing what you're supposed to do. At EMC World, uh, BJ, your, your CTO, Stephen Manley, laid out a vision, you mentioned snapshots before, of uh, really trying to, you know, put forth the, the, the future of right. data protection, where essentially you're attacking the backup window problem in a different way. Yeah. Um, how is that evolving? Can you give us an update on that vision? Yeah, and I, th I think you guys may have Steve and yep. tomorrow with our new head of engineering, Guy Churchward, yep. and I'll tell you, they'll, that's like Abin Costello, <laughs> you'll have a good <laughs> comedic duo <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but uh, we're, we're moving along, and I, I think where, when we look again at backup infrastructure today, our customers have an enormous amount of dollars invested in things like media servers, and you, 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 all of that to, you know, understand catalog and then move data again. You know, we'd like to get to a world where that goes away, where you know the primary storage device, where the data is housed, can communicate directly with your capacity optimized platform. Uh, you know, eliminate a lot of that infrastructure, and you know, for our customers, they get real excited about it again because it goes to this world where, you know. Uh, through metadata or through the understanding of data, I move it where it needs to go, it's automated, it happens, I'm protected, and I don't need to add a whole bunch of infrastructure to assure me that that's going to happen. BJ, um, talk about the mindset of the market right now. Obviously, um, we, mentioned, we said earlier, obviously it's not going to go away, but obviously this shift, there's a shift going on. Joe, Joe was just talking about <laughs> it, you know, up there, we were watching. The horizontal's shorter, vertical's getting steeper, disruption's faster. Um, what do you guys see in terms of this new disruption? What are, you, what are you worried about? What are you working on that you say, hey, you know, we really got to nail that one piece of this market. Uh, is it cloud backup? Is it the integration? Is it the software, all of the above? Can you um, just lend some insight into how your mind's yeah, thinking about I, this? I think it's kind of a, a race with, you know, the, they always give you the car analogy or the airplane analogy where you've got to do a bunch of things and, and keep it moving. Uh, you know, we have to refresh our products constantly. That's table stakes to be in this business. Uh, for us, the two real uh, hands we feel like we have to play are, um, you know, understand a completely virtual wor world and, and bring uh, data protection policies to it. And the second is integration. You know, the ability to simplify uh, data protection for our customers we think is is essential so you know all of our investment you know there's a base level investment that goes into refreshing the products but we are pouring enormous amount of money into uh, you know things like VDP and being uh, you know seamless data protection in a virtual world and then integrating that with a set of tools that EMC has and others have to to eliminate a lot of that infrastructure. Okay, so let me try to be more specific in my yeah. question since I can't get it out of you. Cloud. Um, what are you going to be looking at on your M&A yeah. map? So <laughs> in terms so. of refreshing the product, okay, that's cool, yeah. we're going to tweak the product, and but some well, areas, me, you got to go out yeah. and buy some uh, you know, merging tech, and you guys are writing some checks, EMC is aggressive, Joe's yeah. clearly showed that EMC has really nailed the core competency, and Goulden was on the cube at EMC World, talking about, hey, we like to acquire and we integrate well. Yeah. And you, you know, you live that world with I, I did you know, your, your acquisition. So, yep. you got to have some suspects. Can you share with us your vision? Uh, you know, in, <laughs> in, in, in the backup space, we've done one acquisition, <laughs> and to, to it, it was a mainframe acquisition for BuzzTech <laughs> to do mainframe right. backup. So to say we were out there on the, on the uh, you know, leading, leading edge is, uh, you know, uh, we went backwards to go forwards. Um, <laughs> and mainframe backup, by the way, is very important to us. It's a big market they, still, they, I mean. They use a lot of yeah. tape. Um, you know, I think the things we're looking at, the categories are, are really, uh, we believe in the SMB market and the continued development of, of VDP and expanding that is important to us. But I, I think this, there's this area and it really rests around uh, backup as a service and uh, you know, how data moves to clouds 
and between clouds and whether you know you see the emergence today of cloud gateways you know moving that data a lot um, you know today backup as a service is essentially make a local copy and then replicate that in into a cloud and that's really DR not many people direct back up into a cloud and recover, because the recoverability is so difficult out of the cloud. Yeah. And I think that's the space we'll continue to look at and try and exploit, is how do you control the movement of data from a there's also a blurring, there's a blurring category too that you're playing in. Like we just covered on, on SiliconANGLE, uh, Nirvonic's uh, cloud storage company, although right. they don't bill it as backup, just signed a deal with Fox, pretty big media company. Yeah. It's not Glacier-like backup, but it's, I mean, it's, so what is backup? I mean, it's with well, cloud storage, I, that's in a way, you're putting it out there and bringing it back. That's the space, you know, that is, you know, we have to continue to do more and be more aggressive in is understand that movement of the data between a customer's premise and, you know, uh, a, a uh, cloud. Yeah, there's uh, a use what case they're using there it for. It yeah. hasn't taken off yet. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's been some inhibitors, and a lot of that is just the, I don't think the industry quite has it right yet. Right. You know? And of course, customers don't trust it. It's so evolving, and yeah. that's you know yeah. why, you know, you want to know who I'm going to buy. We're just saying we're looking at that, <laughs> trying to understand. EMC that. has got the checkbook out yeah. for uh, cloud gateways and storage uh, backup. BJ Jenkins. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, president of VRS, I'm, that's, those are I, fun I putting have, words in I your mouth. I have $20 with <laughs> me right now if anybody's <laughs> willing we to speak for that. So we got the speakers back, yeah. so I just want to say, yeah, BJ Jenkins, president of the EMC Backup and Recovery Group, uh, VRS. Um, so backup is not just your traditional meat and potatoes backup, it's pretty disruptive right now in the sense that there's a lot going on yeah. with Flash, as we talked about, and obviously emerging markets like cloud. Um, again, just share with us your agenda for the next 12 months. Product refresh, a little bit of M&A categorical, look at a few things. What else is on well, your 12-month agenda? I, I think if you look at just the penetration of dedupe, there's still a lot of headroom in the market uh, in, in all segments, but if you want to know the next 12 months we're thinking about, it's that conversation we just had. How is data uh, backup as a service, recovery as a service? How is data moving from a customer premise into a uh, service provider or cloud? Um, you can certainly see companies like Amazon with Glacier being more aggressive, trying to get more data into their cloud. Um, mm -hmm. That's something Microsoft would like. Joe Tucci would say that's Roach Motel, but right. I mean, it's got an upgrade path. But it's a yeah. signal. It's a signal that yeah. Amazon's you know, it's signaled data a number movement. of trends yeah. before. So they're Dave, as the analyst, you've been covering this market. I want to ask, because you're deeper than I am on some of the, the historical uh, pr uh, past as well as the trajectory of, we've talked in the future about data infrastructure. What's your take? I mean, you've seen this market move and mature and change. What's your take on the uh, backup and recovery market? Well, I think the, the notion of backup or data, I use, I use the term data protection <laughs> as a service, uh, is the right one. Um, I think historically, backup's been a one size fits all. Well, you know, regardless of your RPO, your RTO, your business value, just here's the backup level that you get. Here's the level of data protection that you get, and if you can afford SRDF, go for it. <laughs> and that just doesn't cut it. You got to be able to dial down and dial up your so your, intelligence. Your, your service level. Yeah. But it's like you were talking before, it's policy based. It's, and, it's, and it's being able to offer a set of services that are granular, that are, that are application based, that and, are and I, I, tailored to I the mean application. I mean the thing we're talking about here, this will, over time, it's going to move to a service. Yeah, yeah. Right, it, yeah, it's yeah. all going to move to a service. Okay, so now just taking one step further to connect the dots, um, the big vision from Steve, and we've been talking about uh, with OpenFlow, but now here at Nasir, a software-defined data center. Yeah. That's obviously a strategic imperative, and it's obvious why. It's an operating system. <laughs> software is, you can do all kinds of policy. How does that change, if any, or is it just the normal course for you guys? Well, I think if you look at VDP, that's, again, that's software, right? And. Uh, I, I think you'll only see that grow from uh, a da data protection standpoint. Now, the, the reality of here and now though is it, when you're talking data protection, we design what we do as the storage of last resort. I, if we're not there, customers fail. And that's great, you can have software do that, and there's a lot of people who design that from a software-based approach, but the reality is you got to have some hardware understanding because disk drives still fail, unfortunately. Tapes still fail. 
And if your software doesn't have a way to do data integrity and- Flash and will fail. It, flash well, I mean, business, flash business, will fail. Business so. value is the big trend here. I'm hearing right. at VMworld, and tomorrow we're going to have uh, Dave on. I didn't have an updated day. We're going to have Sean Douglas as well as the, the new head of EMC Ventures on. Uh, to explore some of the things around software-defined right. networking. Obviously, they were involved in uh, a variety of different transactions, but you know there are new use cases for uh, business value type apps that will sit in these environments. We're going to hear from that, and and mainly I see EMC Ventures as like the the modern in our modern uh, era analogy is the new Intel Capital. Um, since well, they got uh, Scott Darling from Intel. They've got so Scott that's Darling right. from yeah. Intel, <laughs> and they're aggressive. I mean, they were in software networking for, you know, I know for, for years, and then he, Scott came oh, yeah. in with Pat, they pulled the trigger on Nasera as well as some other ones that I can't disclose, although I could break some news right now, but I, I, I swore I would not uh, share the other investments so that won't. they made. Uh, no. we'll, we'll, say, we'll say that for tomorrow when I put them to the feet of the fire. So. Well, but you're, now you're in the valley now, so that's got to give you a whole new perspective on, on m and right? I mean, is that, is that true? It's or is much it, different than the I mean, East right? Coast. I mean, yeah. it's got to be, I mean, it's a night and day. I mean, it's just really is, I mean, that's my, my perspective anyway, point of view, but well, I, you live there now, so it's. Yeah, there's just, the enormity of activity that goes on here in capital that goes right. into companies in our space is far heavier than where our corporate headquarters are. So certainly there's more weight here around that. And I think just the, the talent management and movement part of that is, you know, every day your employees choose where to show up for work. And if you're right. not, you know, on the cutting mm -hmm. edge or, the lack or of pushing the limits. The speed at which decisions get made. It's the, fast, the, you got to move the, fast. The, the, the risk tolerance is yeah. different. It's, uh, it's and I, 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 you know, I think, uh, you know, I'll speak from my own view, you know, when you buy something at 2.4 billion and show up and you don't know the company, there's a lot of risk in that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of risk in, yeah. and, and fortunately, EMC's had a core competency in making work but, it, but that's a lot of risk. You'd much rather invest and know at 100 million or you know 200 million purchase price and make that gamble. You can make uh, yeah. you know 20 of those for the uh, two two billion dollars. Well, like extreme IO. Right? I mean, that you was. Know? Um, and I think that's the yeah. thought behind it. You'll yeah. probably hear that from Scott. But it's yeah. it's be on the front of these things yeah. rather than letting them get to well, that Well, Gould laid it out at EMC World. I mean, basically they have some investors, they make kind of headlight deals where they get in early and kind of get to understand that, but clearly they, they'd rather let the risk reduce and validate with an overpayment on a deal and then take the risk on the integration. So yeah. it's clearly that you guys are the poster uh, corporate company in terms of the poster child uh, of acquisitions. I mean, HP and others have yeah. just failed to acquire and integrate well and it's caused a lot of problems. So you guys got that down. That's a good core competency and you blend that with R&D. I, I, I think that ability to let the entrepreneur who's founded this and his entrepreneurial team, uh, I, at least everyone I've met has a passion not just to sell their company, they have a passion to change, impact customers, change the world. Yeah. And you got to give them that vehicle to do that. And, and that, that's the good EMC brings to the equation. Mm -hmm. We can show them ways to accelerate that impact and keep them on board. So if we can get them earlier in the cycle, that's yeah, yeah. that's a good thing. I mean, for I think us. This, in this modern era, um, you know, the future case studies, Harvard Business School case studies, will be written up. And, and point, I predict will point to EMC as that seminal moment, that company that changed the dynamic of integrations. And I think they're going to watch a lot of the Cube coverage too, Dave, because we've documented <laughs> it in all for three years, watching EMC kind of take their journey. So. Uh, BJ, thanks for coming back on theCUBE. Really thanks, appreciate guys. it. Great to see Great you. Seeing yeah. you. Awesome. Okay, thank you. thanks very much. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back with the final wrap up with myself and Dave, Dave Vellante to wrap up day one right after the short break. We'll be right back. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer.
First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the cube now. Right, and, you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the cube. Hey, I'm about to go on the cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm uh, a three-time veteran of being on the cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackett, Chad, welcome to the cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from, uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event and I know there's a lot of it it's a great vehicle to uh, to communicate with a broad audience a lot of folks watch great to have you back good job all right Craig Nunez uh, VP of marketing at HP Storage. thanks very much for coming on the cube when people mention the cube they they're like oh my god I saw you on the cube and they're all excited about it it's it's a it's an experience it's not just information they experience kind of what's going on there it's like real time it's like they were there that was like My going to the pleasure. gym boom boom legendary IBMer CEO of Symantec and now CEO of virtual instrument uh, great to have you on the cube so for cube to be here at a conference like this that's got 15 20,000 people and sharing that live around the world that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving so it's a wonderful media wonderful media. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from, from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube, and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought-provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to settle for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit them up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP. Some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts, compare you to the choices our users have, and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time. And so that's real talk, not just uh, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside the Cube. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise, and share that with you. And great guest lineups. We've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible. They, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times. And I think the, the interesting thing about, the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes. And you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of, uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just, you know, a honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them. And I, I enjoy being there because I, I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I honestly answer questions uh, with, with the full intent of being able to be um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're going to turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions. I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise, you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other, and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on the Cube, and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave and, and 
they're really amazing guys. I mean, the, the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm, I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly. And if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah. Thank you.